All right. It's my pleasure to introduce our poet tonight. We're delighted to have Emmett here uh, to feature him as our poet on this February 14th, Valentine's Day. Emmett lives in Portland where he reads, writes, and performs poetry. He's published five books of poetry. He sees things we think we know. The Meaning of Me, Bread Widow, and his first hardback collection, Fragments. He's written four chapbooks under the titles Queen of the Nile, I Too Am a Slave, The Majestic, and Midnight in Madrid. His poems have been published in online journals and periodicals. He's also released non-lyrical CD titled Speak and three lyrical poetry CDs. When I was young, is a thematic CD which speaks to love, hope, betrayal, and fidelity. I Loved You Once contains poetry writing set to jazz, blues, and pop musical in influences. So I have heard Emmett perform uh, his spoken word poetry with backing accompaniment, and it's terrific. Then Poetry Blues features some of Oregon's most talented jazz and blues musicians. His latest release is Welcome Home, having musical compositions by Portland pianist Jim Blackburn, narration by Lynn Derroch, and spoken words written and recited by Emmett. I'm just looking to see if there's a chair here. Is there someone here? Hmm. Oh, okay. Okay, well this is uh, this is great. This is great timing. Yeah, this is great timing, so we have it just before Emmett comes up. Uh, he's performed lyrical poetry in local jazz venues such as Ivory Jazz Lounge and Restaurant, Tony Starlights, uh, the Backspace Cafe, Portland's fabulous Arlene Schnitzer Hall, and many venues around the Portland area. Would you join me in welcoming our poet for tonight, Emmett Wheatfall. Emmett. Let me begin this evening by saying good evening to you. And if you would do something for me, would you turn to the person to your left and your right and just tell them, Happy Valentine's. Happy Valentine's. <laughs> Oh, that gave me time to gather my literature. <laughs> or ligature, whichever one you want to work with. L let me begin by saying to you that if the Clackamas County Sheriff pulls up looking for a lady named Karen Wheatfall, she's right here. <laughs> and uh, the only reason why I got a chance to come out tonight on Valentine's is because she knows how much I love the Milwaukee Poetry Series. And I want to let you folks know that for a number of years, I look for a place where grown folk, <laughs> adults, <laughs> serious poets, gather to write and read poetry. And uh, this community has really received me and welcomed me, and I, I really feel at home, and I wanted to say thank you. I also wanted to say thank you before I begin to the Milwaukee Poetry Series Committee, because they took a look at my poetic works, and at least they found it worthy uh, at this point for me to be a featured reader, to, in, reader in the 11th uh, season of the Milwaukee uh, Poetry Series. So would you please give them a hand? <laughs> Anyone who does poetry knows that when you're asked to come and do a reading, it's a challenge sometimes to figure out what of your work you're going to read. Is it going to be thematic? Is it just going to be from your collection? Uh, you want to read things that when people leave, they feel inspired by the poet's work. And I want to let you know tonight that um, as I was looking at what I wanted to read, I have, of course, five books. And uh, most of you know that uh, when you see a lot of these little yellow things here, people think that you're going to read all of them. 
And that means that you're going to be here all night. And, <laughs> and I'm not going to do that. I just marked these in these books uh, that, if by chance I feel inclined to, I'll, I'll maybe read some of these. But if not, these books are in the back back there. Uh, I have a little saying, I cannot speak for my poetry. My poetry must speak for itself. I can brag about it all I want, but if it doesn't speak to you, there's not much more that I can do. So I may not read anything from this tonight, but I just want to let you know that those are there. To begin with, how do I want us to enter in um, to hearing my work? And I'd like to begin this way tonight. This, an open door leads to an unwritten poem somewhere in the well of your imagination. Close the door gently. Write the poem slowly, savoring every word and every image. Go there, beyond the page, into the distant world, the intangible realm, that metaphysical place. It's safe there. How do I know this? Close the door gently. Thank you. Tonight, what I want to do is actually read you a number of poems, and the things that I'd like for you to pay attention to is um, first probably syntax. Um, you know, it's an orderly arrangement of words, how words are arranged. And I'd like you to pay attention to diction, the word choice that is used in the context of syntax. And what you're going to hear tonight is probably a variety of voices. Um, and so I'd like to start with a poem that I wrote called Think Pablo Neruda. Think Pablo Neruda. If not for being a woman, you would not want this. Let me gaze into your light brown eyes. Guide my finger between your breasts. Inhale your breath. Feel desire. As if so famished, I'm kindling, thirsting for a flame. Rushing water, looking for a path that gives me that existential feeling of weightlessness, of joy, lust, as if reviving on shore on some desert isle. I see how your desire for me lifts to new heights as if a fledgling rising in flight. Suddenly, you turn from me. Your tears begin to flow, for you are overcome with emotion. From where does this wind flow? The cause wherefore wind chimes jingle, signaling your need to be held, your eyes hint. I take leave of any selfishness. What I bear is not burden, but love. Recalling as when in our youth, the first moment we dared ourselves to cleave, consuming our love in this, our abode. Now, if as before every moment, I feel as you feel and you I, with sweet and softness, the feel of a falling petal placed in the pathway of passion. You, my love, my darling, set me ablaze. You being my bliss. Think Pablo Neruda. Thank you. Something a little different. Pay close attention to the language. It's called, Oh Juliet, Oh Juliet. <laughs> of love, what does a Romeo know? Is it conquest? 
guile, sweet sensuality found in for certain surrender, Romeo's lair being the feathered pillow filled with lies, eyes encroaching upon the egress of innocence, compliments compounded over time, teasing laced as if an assassin's poison. Oh, Juliet. <laughs> of love, what does a Romeo know? Is it ego, self-adulation, social serendipity fabricated in false narrative? Romeo's sexual prowess, the tour de force of prior rumor, lust-laden women who rue fidelity and virtue, braggadocious men ballyhooing incessant immoral banter who dream of such conquests. Oh, Juliet. Awake, Juliet, cast off hypnosis, brush away floating feathers, be not led to lay in his lair. Let not Romeo's encroach upon your egress. Bat away his suggestive eyes. Treasure fidelity and preserve your virtue. Of love, what does a Romeo know? Is it conquest? Is it ego? To yourself be true, O oh, Juliet. Thank you. A sonnet. A sonnet. This winter's night gives rise to new question. Why hath thy lust turned to fevered passion? Am I thy fine? and princely looking friend, a boy among children, man among men. Thy rose in red doth spread in wanton need. So flush thy face as bare thy breast do heave. Unchaste thy nakedness in dark this light. Why protest so loud thy mourning, thy delight? So stiff my staff hast thou let full thy womb, a rush of seed to seize, then lay, then bloom. Thy pleasure doth foreshadow coming pain, when all thy screams shall curse thy lust in vain. Be sweet, O oh release, again and again. Be sweet, O oh release, again. And again, a poem entitled, Be Sweet, <laughs> O oh, Release. How about another sonnet? You guys open the sonnets tonight? Is that all right? Yeah. Anybody write sonnets? No, they're not easy to write. You've got to get the meter right. Where's the stress? Did you get the stress right? And I tell you, writing sonnets drives me wild. But I write sonnets because they force you to be disciplined. They force you to think. And so um, this is what I call we dance with wine. We dance with wine. So goes the soft sounds of the new sonnet. She reads to me her pledge to me of love and blew her brassiere and black her bonnet atop the stool reserved for young doves. She sings a song so sweet it crests like waves of shiny light upon the entrance of this my vestibule, of this my enclave, where a mockingbird dare not mock thereof. We dance with wine the dark made vineyard light, too vain to feign the coming shame so foul. We purr the cat's meow and the dog's delight. Illicit love, lusting and loud, the lingered growls. So goes the soft sound of the new sonnet. 
she reads to me her pledge to me of love. Sonnets. I figured that since tonight was Valentine's, I'd bring to you quite a few love poems. So um, if you're here with that person that means a lot to you, snuggle up with them. Squeeze them. <laughs> slip, it's okay. Slip your hand in their hand. So soft the sweet poet you are. Who weaves you with what? What contemplations purge the dross of you? Whose ink spills forth from fountain upon once a blank page? Is there litmus for license you take? Teasing like talons from a quill of quips. I know you. I'm nearer than the wisp of wisdom laid light by slight of stroke, as if the brush of tender blush applied faintly to concrete wards. If spurned by you, I succumb, whereupon the page I'll gaze as the light in my eyes dissipate, fading in the elegy of your soft words. So sweet, poet, you are. You are. Who weaves you? Poem entitled, Who Weaves You? <laughs> How are we doing tonight? We doing all right? Yeah. Is this speaking to you? If not, I'll change up. I'll do something different. <laughs> if, if you want me to do spoken word, I can do spoken word. I can do all that. No, I want to stay true to page poetry tonight. That's what what tonight is about. Poem called Sea of Love. Sea of Love. The sea surfaced a lily, soft, swirling, and belonging to the sea. A wash in the deep tide, light, wet, wasting away, atop a frothy wash, arriving at bride's feet, new, resident, Settling is its arrival, all the while, so full the sea of love, silly, pithy, yielding its treasured fullness, inconspicuous the sand, silt, sedentary, its contiguous gathering all the while, a bride's lone omen, salient, sudden, Upon a surprised bride, she lifts the saline lily, wet, dripping. Her spirit is again lifted, all the while falling from her hair, fresh, firm, is a new lily falling to the sea, deep to deep, sinking, descending to the deep depths all the while, so full, the sea of love, silly, pithy, soon to yield its treasured fullness. Sea of love. A poem entitled, To Whom But Love. To Whom But Love. To whom but love do I owe anything? or anything but love, O oh me. So tacit is the meaning of our love, we being meek who inherit the earth, like brownstones in courtyards and parks, emblematic of moments marked in perpetuity, the profound essence of a thing once stayed. Too well the great lovers reveled in love all the while the prisoners of canonical virtue. Only now they, found them, they find themselves bound in the bountiful tomes of literature, wherein once loved is never forgotten, nor nuanced in the ever-changing narrative. Quintessential is the question, what is love without the shedding of blood? For every lover of love does bleed, 
The scarlet letter has always bled red, evidenced by the crimson of certain stain. Red the rose resting upon her breast and gown the clothes altar to true love. So I wonder, I wonder, as love does of me, to whom but love do I owe anything or anything but love owe me? Tuesday morning love poem. Why Tuesday morning? I don't know. It just worked. <laughs> Pick the day of the week. Tuesday morning. You know, there's a lot more that went into it. Tuesday morning love poem. Far and away your love returns to me. At this the edge of the Isle of Crete. Your love is life to me. Beyond sand-soaked shores, each wave never refrains from waving to me, reminding me it's you beyond where they begin and me where they end. Me being temperate, balmy, stoic, you being feminine, serene, and soft. We dance the dance on distant shores. Between us exists the tension between time and space, the nexus between my face and your embrace, your heart and my embrace. I will not return to the mountains behind me, they being the backbone of Crete, no. I will always stand alone, manning the oars of my soul until the tide never recedes again, as do we weary men, we weary men who long for love. Mm. You folks need to fall in love tonight, have you? <laughs> We just got you guys all bugs. We are. Let me see if I let me see if I can Paula, let me see if I can lighten it up for him a little bit tonight, okay? This is called We Tango. Anybody know what the tango is? Tango. We tango. Watch this. Pay close attention. The landlady lingers lustfully at my door. She's certain I want her. I do. <laughs> but I don't. She seeks to relieve me of my virginity, and I the key to keeping my door locked. So we tango. Alluring is the scent of her apple plum perfume. My impatience inarguably, inarguably releases the pheromones of musk. So we tango. We tango until the landlady has my virginity. <laughs> and I, the key to keeping my door locked. But now, I never lock my door. <laughs> so we tango. <laughs> Figured I better light you guys up a little bit. This is a little too deep, a little too deep. This is called Every Woman's Romantic. Every Woman's Romantic. Inside me lives every woman's man, a robust rogue known for romance, that infatuating character, caricature called Romeo, him who is the swashbuckling Aeroflan. Anybody ever heard of Aeroflan? Mm -hmm. Cascading contrails of Casanova's conquest. Anybody heard of Casanova? <laughs> this next guy you better know about, Don Juan's magical spell. In me, each one of them longs to live, to leap the limits of masculine imagination, tangle in the web of wanton dalliance whisper wickedly to sinfully laden women, 
lie awash in a sea of sensual lasciviousness. Arise to dance the dance in torrid tango. I'm the robust rogue known for romance. For inside me lives every woman's romantic. <laughs> That's a big imagination, isn't it? <laughs> the poet thinks well of himself. Yeah. You know, I wonder how many people fell in love listening to Pablo Neruda, great Chilean poet. Derek Walcott, these folks were just incredible poets who, who wrote about love. Got a really, really short poem. Anybody ever heard of Banshee? Banshee? Banshee, it's a female spirit, a seducing spirit. And so I wrote a poem entitled Banshee. And so why did you write about it? Because I just like the word Banshee. <laughs> so I wanted to work with it. It's a real short poem, one stanza. And I want you to pay close attention. Oh, one thing I'd like for you to understand about me is that when I write poetry, there's always a pearl in the clam. I have no said about my work. There's always a, there's always a nut inside the, the walnut. And so when you hear my poetry, I know sometimes it's tough sometimes because you're trying to process stuff between the timing of what the ear hears and our cognitive ability to be able to process those. Um, and that's why when I read the poetry sometimes, I like to slow down reading the poem because Sometimes, you know, the listener will pull up to the stop sign and want to contemplate surroundings, but the poet has gone to the next one and to the next one, and you kind of get lost. So I try to slow down on my reading to give people an opportunity to, to, to kind of stay with me. It's called Banshee. Banshee. It's short. Last night's full moon, I encountered... Banshee, we made mad love. It ended in silence. Later, Banshee died. Lighter is my body now. Lost is my soul. Let me read that to you again. I don't have a problem reading the poem a couple of times because sometimes you just got to hear it. Listen closely. Last night's full moon, I encountered a banshee. We made mad love. It ended in silence. Later, banshee died. Lighter is my body now. Lost, Gale is my soul. Poem called Banshee. Just a few more, just a few more in the in the love in the love genre, and um, I think I'll switch up and maybe read some uh, read some prose poetry, something in, in terms of relationship. I kind of did some of the other more sophisticated stuff. It's called "Let the Lace Fall." Anybody here know what lace is? I'll, I'll leave it alone. All right, <laughs> just go with me. A lace is a lazy link to something other than what you've not imagined right now, especially if sheer and of light veneer. Draw me nearer. Pull me the distance where to entanglement is binding, and the only thing to barter is yes or no. The pebbles in the pond continue to pile up beneath the surface, coalescing in swirls, distributed in currents so carried away, a new meaning finds residency. Bubbling up is the beauty of a surrendered disposition, repositioning itself with unrepressed affluence, reaching for the light of life from the depths of a dark deep. If necessary, let the lace fall. 
lavishly descending to the floor. What remains is the lust of the eyes, the desire of flesh, and a renewed sense of passion that the lace fall. How about some prose poetry? We'll do something a little bit different here. And these poems I'm going to share with you tonight um, are poems that have the potential for uh, a, a, a book. Um, what I've done is I've written five books of poetry, and generally they're, they're collections. And, um, but one thing I haven't done is what you know, Bill Stafford talked about following the golden thread, you know, writing a collection where there's a, there's, a, there's a theme that works all the way through. And so it's not so much a collection, but there's a theme. And um, I have two names that I chose to use for these poems, and the central characters are Victor and Vivian. Well, why Victor and Vivian? I just like V's. Victor, you guys got to wake up tonight. V, Victor, Victor and Vivian. Victor consumes self-deception like volumes of self-help books. Ink and wet paper paperbacks will fade in time. If only Victor had taken to her. Victor could have traveled to places he'd never dreamed of. Vivian watches him with great disdain. Victor lacks imagination. What could be something beautiful is vain. Every love story is a tale formed in stories as old as time. Vivian talked to him about this in the beginning. Over time, Vivian's heart grew dim. The ink in Vivian's heart faded in the wetness of her exasperation. To Vivian, love had to be about concurrence. Water and debris should flow downhill together. Sifting through debris is quite the conscious decision, like matters of the heart. Vivian will never find help and self-help books. Their story dried long ago in the faded ink of her exasperation. Mm. Victor and Vivian. We're still talking about Victor and Vivian. <laughs> it's called All the While. All the While. Vivian proceeds to fasten her seatbelt. Her backpack stomach impedes progress. Toyota FJs are off-road vehicles with three windshield wiper blades. Most passengers are left cross-eyed. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll get it. It'll, it'll hit you about 2 o'clock in the morning. You'll sit straight up and do I got that. Victor is impulsive. Vivian thinks most men are. For example, Victor has just backed out of the driveway as Vivian struggles to buckle up. Anybody been there? <laughs> the exasperated look on Vivian's face says it all. A thousand curse words strung together with sublime symmetry would not appease her emboldened anger. Instead, Vivian buries them in the vault she's reserved for warehousing Victor's infractions. <laughs> In marriage, infractions accumulate. If unheralded vitriol were a measuring stick, Victor is about an inch away from a tongue lashing that will leave lasting emotional ligatures. All the while, unbeknown to Victor is the fact the left turn signal continues to blink <laughs> incessantly. <laughs> Gotta watch my time here. Does love lie? When does love turn to hate? 
Is it conceived in moments of infatuation? Does it begin having peered through the veneer of one's own selfishness? What's to be said for margins framing such moments? Vivian asks herself these questions. As abstract as they are, relevance within the context of her understanding of the meaning of love. Vivian is growing accustomed to hatred. How does a woman come to despise antithesis? Victor is her. She's seen herself reflected in him. Vivian assumes the posture of being Victor's bone, her flesh subsumed by him when cleaving in his arms, with him buried deep between her thighs, his mouth ravishing her ample breasts. Does love lie? For certain, it can't be hate. <laughs> Just a couple more. I'm going to do it on time, Tom. Very good. OK. Keep going. OK. When Victor worries. When Victor worries. <laughs> At times in Victor, at times in life, Victor worries. Victor is no different than most humans who question the origin of human life. It's obvious everything re reproduces after its kind. Victor wonders why most times kindness does not do the same. Vivian is the love of his life. Yet their life is consumed with constant strife. Vivian can be lethal and volatile, like nitrogen coming in contact with oxygen. She is nitrogen. Victor, the oxygen, she inhales. What Victor loathes is the loathing of Vivian's volatility. And he has ever wanted, all he has ever wanted was to be life and love to her. So why is it every time he speaks Vivian is so combustible. Why is she so volatile? When a man looks for meaning in his wife, his offer of marriage means something. Again, at such times in life, Victor worries. Uh. I've got a, just, just a few minutes left. Annie Lightheart is here tonight. Would you, would you stand for just a moment? She taught a workshop. Yes. She taught a workshop about telling poets that sometimes great poets have written about objects. They've used objects. Paul Ann, and one of the workshops I was in with her, my poem Rid that, that, that I wrote, uh, Paul Ann let us, gave us a prompt, and I worked on that. But in Annie Lightheart's uh, workshop, she talks about an object. And so there was this object that she had spread out, object spread out on the table. And immediately when she said it, I picked that object. Let me read the poem to you real quick and then maybe I'll talk about it. And then I'll end with a, because we want to end Tim Till, right? Keep going. <laughs> okay. Keep going. All right. Listen very closely. You have to listen very closely. Remember, this is an object that this poem came from. Why call to me as if from the grave in a manicured field? You being yellow in casement, elongated, pristine, and polished, reminiscent of a coffin housing someone loved, someone recently departed, singularly a past life. Please note, I've seen closed caskets before, fashioned shut by funeral directors, coffins situated in sanctuaries aptly called chapels. Coffins are never counted in actuaries. However, coffins are placed in either open or closed graves. This marine band yellow box with its silver harmonica inside, <laughs> as if in sanctuary summoned me. I opened the marine band yellow box, whereby subconsciously it suggested, play a tune for me. 
I'm not dead. I just needed a, I just need some fresh air. <laughs> you see, it was an object. It was, it was her son's little yellow box with a marine band harmonica in it. And it reminded me of a coffin. The harmonica is in the coffin, but it isn't dead. And I can, can bring it back to life if I just breathe breath into the harmonica. Yeah. Would, you, would you put your hands together for that? That was just, I, I, really, I really treasure, um, I really treasure that. You know, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to a, just a, maybe just a couple poems out of, the, out of my um, books and uh, share those with you because, you know, I have a couple that, um, that really speak to me. And um, I want to share them with you. Um, it may take a moment. Uh, if you haven't noticed, I'm African American. <laughs> <laughs> Might not have crossed your mind based on the language of my poetry. But the thing I love about poetry is that I can be just about anything. I could be an Irish boy that loves Irish girls. I could be a tree. <laughs> I could go back to antebellum. I can be in medieval England. I, there, this is the beauty of our art form. It's the beauty of your art. You can actually transpose from your imagination on the canvas, and we do that with poetry. This is called My Face, My Face. My face is your face and yours is mine. For the likeness is obvious to me. Who are you, I ask, as I stare deeply into the mirror of my own self? I'm not afraid of you because I'm black like charcoal and the ashes of ember, one tarnished by the heat of the blazing sun, even that dried basil and such. There can be no greater love for you in that I cherish you with such divine reason and reject the notion our color in any way, shape, or fashion degrades our blackness. A hue so fine, my heart swoons when I behold the face of my own self. Thank you. Just bear with me just a minute. <clears throat> I'm going to share this poem and then one closing poem, one final poem. And I really want to read the final poem because the final poem is very, very important to me. It's one that I, I love and I think the final poem will speak to, to some degree of humility. But I want to read this poem, and I think you'll enjoy this. It's called A Small Town. A Small Town. A light blinks yellow, its reason unknown. A brilliant idea of minute proportion, of resolute relevance. Above the two-lane street, it hangs regulating time and space of them going nowhere, ending up somewhere in a small town for some reason. A filling station, a convenience store, cafe and bar in a small town. That's all it needs, all it will ever be, a small town. The parking meter, the sheriff's car, like vagrancy, a nuisance, or kids on Saturday night, all five of them, <laughs> drag racing the strip, <clears throat> agitating the street light that blinks yellow, regulating time and space in a small town. Hills do not lie. They hide small towns with small people who have big hearts small wallets, a single ATM machine 
progress. <laughs> progress in a small town. The president rolled through yesterday under blinking yellow light on his way to the big city as everyone lined the strip, waving the flag, all 28 people and their children held from school <laughs> in a small town. Final call. You folks have been very gracious, very attentive. I really appreciate that. Um, I do a lot of uh, public speaking professionally and stuff like that. And, um, you know, you kind of learn to read your audience. And what I appreciate about you, I didn't catch too many people checking out on me. <laughs> Thinking about what you're going to do when you get home and all this. This is my last poem. Listen closely. A letter to the editor. I have read Whitman, sought counsel from Hughes, reveled in Neruda, marveled at Frost. I find Brooks bold, Plath sophisticated, Lord a black lesbian, Hudson yet to be known. I have loved Dickinson, struggled with Gluck, found inspiration in Angelou, studied with Oliver. I see Walcott as fascinating, enjoy affinity with Langston, W.S. Merwin Earthy, Collins Complex, myself unremarkable. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very kind, very gracious. Thank you very much. Very fitting for Valentine's. Thank you. All kinds of love. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So for questions. Mm -hmm. We've got some time for questions and mine's a two part one. Uh oh. Uh, when do you when do you write? You know, what's your writing practice? And you also do poems with musical background. Sure. How do you decide mm -hmm. which ones to just be spoken word? Uh, which ones you want to set to music? Uh, well, first and foremost, this wonderful lady right here that I've been married to for thirty-seven years really sets me free. Um, she, you know, usually on Fridays, I work four day work week, seven to six, four o'clock, I'm scouting. So I have Fridays off, and usually on Fridays, I have a little coffee shop. Everybody has a place I go to a coffee shop. And I've been writing there for a year. Most of these books were written in that coffee shop and, and on Saturdays. And if I'm, if, if, if I'm at the dining room table and I'm writing, she has learned me so well that she knows I'm somewhere. <laughs> and she doesn't bother me. And she just, and then when I read the poem to her, she don't know what I said. <laughs> but she listens to every poem. But, but, but my writing style is that it just, bits and pieces come to me like fragments. And um, so if I'm sitting there, I will work them. Uh, most of us know some poems can take 18 to 20 hours over a period of time. Some poems come in a flash. But my writing is that I'm, I could be writing on a car and a phrase will come. I'll be sitting somewhere and I'll jot it down and I'll rework it later. And then there are some poems that I've spent hours on that three hours and I've looked at it and I said, ah, and I bought it up. It just doesn't work. So I have no real set writing time, but if I do, it's generally on a Friday or a Saturday um, that, that I'll do that. And how do I set poetics to music? Um, anyone who knows anything about poet, know, uh, poetry knows that our poetry is usually metrical, you know, um, if it's a pentameter, you know, um, you know, you can, you can actually fit it in, in rhythms. And so sometimes um, what I'll do is that, uh, you know, in rhymes, most all music today is generally done by in rhymes, whether it's A, B, you know, A, C, or whatever, like to A, A, B, B. That's what most music does. So a lot of times what you hear is that people who are doing 
lyrical poetry, there's a lot of in rhymes. And those in rhymes differentiate to me. I don't do rap. I let people know. I'm too old to do rap. I'm not going to put on a jersey. I'm not going to drop a microphone. I don't do that. I do poetry. I do spoken word. So the lyrical to music oftentimes will have in rhymes at the end of the stitch, at the end of the line. And, um, you know, I just figure out what, what works, what works. So that's how I go about it. And, and uh, I'm committed to that. Um, I love what Paul Ann Peterson said about Bill Stafford, which I listen. I really listen. Um, he was telling about the time when he was at school and the student, remember he said, student asked, what do you do when you have writer's block? He was like, and the kid got, you said the kid got a little upset because what do you do when nothing comes? And he just says, I write. And I, I, took, I took that away from what you're sharing and, and I don't suffer from writer, writer's block. I just write. Yes. No, those those are composites. There's about five or six of them now. They're the genesis for what's coming as a book. Buy all the books this oh no, they're not in the book. <laughs> but hopefully, there a book will come from that because I, I believe that talking about poetically relationship, people can identify with those things done in a poetic way. Yeah. I thought I saw. Oh yes. Yes. Yes, up in. Cascades. Yeah, that was that was horrible. Yes. One of the Victor and Vivian poems, I don't know what, but right at the beginning, mm -hmm. you were talking about where does hate begin. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. God, I love that beginning. You. Mm -hmm. you could write a whole play out of that. Absolutely. I hope so. Something like that. Hopefully something out of Victor and Vivian could become a play. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you like that. Yes. That's what I'm Do you remember an early experience that was an important launching for you when you were a child? Maybe uh, what, mm -hmm. what really made poetry mm -hmm. come to you and be with you mm -hmm. in your life? It's a great question. Um, I, I was involved in theater in high school and college. I had a distinct privilege of playing Othello in oh. college. Oh, wow. Her father loved me often, invited me to still question me the story. I still remember some of those soliloquies, but. Um, and I have done some voiceovers and stuff over the years at work, but what really got me involved in poetry, um, a great jazz pianist died here a number of years ago named Janice Scroggins. Mm -hmm. And a good friend of Karen and I's, uh, her husband, uh, it was his birthday, and she, she wrote a poem, but she wanted me to read it for her at his birthday. Mm -hmm. And when I read it, I, could, I didn't know anything about poetry, but I just knew that it, it wasn't very well composed very well written. So I honored her and I asked her permission. Can I rework this? And I reworked it. And I thought I'd do something special with it. So I called up Janice and said, hey, I'd like to record this lyrically. I hadn't done it before. And she said, sure. So we went in the studio, Gail, and Miss Scroggins just she, she was Grammy nominated because she did a Scott Joplin piece where you play in different rhythms in each hand. So she started to play and I started to recite my version of the poem. And I noticed the sound guy was bobbing his head. And I said, hmm. I fell in love with poetry at that moment. And then I went and studied poetry and I continued to study poetry and I continued to learn from it. Um, so many of you, um, especially in the Milwaukee Poetry Series. And uh, from that point on, I was bit. Um, I have a little moniker that I say, um, I write to appease the creative hunger raging in my soul. Are there any more questions? Well, let's give him another hand. Thank you, sir. And before we disperse, one of our committee members, I'd like to have a hand for her, too. Uh, Nancy Lee is going to come up and take the microphone, but she's responsible for the refreshments tonight. Let's get, can we give Nancy Lee a hand? So she wanted to take the microphone for a few minutes.
I'm not as well spoken as Emmett, so I have notes. Oh. <laughs> this is the second time this week that I had the privilege of hearing Emmett, actually in the last four days, along with some other people that are here tonight. For some of you, this will not have context. If you haven't heard his new Welcome Home CD, I strongly encourage it. He has it for sale this evening in the back, along with his books. If you'll indulge me for a moment, I'd like to say a special thanks to you, Emmett. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Emmett, I'd like to say, welcome home. You found the place in the Milwaukee poetry community. I know you watch carefully what you eat now that life dictates healthy exchanges. <laughs> These strawberries are a strong reminder of the poem, Welcome Home. Please enjoy their delicious flavor just as we have feasted on your words this evening. <laughs> This mason jar is inspired by your poem, Brown People Were Here. It may not be filled with lemonade, but it is filled with chocolate kisses of gratitude for who you are, what you bring to us, and how you inspire the poetry community. Please accept this bouquet from the Milwaukee Poetry Committee. We are so blessed you have spent this time with us tonight. <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly during Black History Month. We applaud you and we thank you. You're very kind. You're very sweet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Emmett has books back here. There's refreshments. Please help yourself to the refreshments. He's going to be here to sign books and to talk and so forth. If you'd like to take some refreshments home with you, please do that. That's what they're for. Thank you for coming, everybody. And, um,
So we can do from May to the last one. But June is a possibility. Okay. I mean, I'm kind of looking for something else.